fantasy team, so it's a rough night for me. Uh, my name is Sarah Isger. I will be moderating this panel for you. I am the co-host, or actually, no, I'm just the host now, of the podcast Advisory Opinions with David French. We took off his host title. He had misbehaved um, at one point getting a case wrong. Uh, and we will uh, be running through the big cases for this coming term as well as some of the broader themes that I think are coming out from this Supreme Court as it is constituted, uh, and what we may be looking forward to this term as well. So each panelist has prepared some nuggets for you, and I will introduce them as they deliver those nuggets. Um, as you saw, Gene was providing us all water, so he will be, um, if you need anything at your table, just shout for Gene, um, <laughs> and he will come do that. Uh, Nick, we're going to start with you, and Nick Rosencrantz is a professor at Georgetown University, and he is also Tony-nominated, um, so if he breaks out into song or otherwise, we should feel very blessed, and you are going to cover some of the First Amendment cases for us coming up this term. I am, and I'm delighted to be here, so uh, I've been asked to talk about the First Amendment. first case I'm going to talk about is Vidal v. Elster. Um, so this is a trademark case. Uh, Section 1052C of the um, Lanham Act, t Title 15, provides that a trademark will be refused registration if it consists of or comprises a name, portrait, or signature identifying a particular living individual except by his written consent. Uh, so the issue in this case, uh, somebody wants to register the trademark Trump too small uh, with a little icon of a small little hand, I believe. <laughs> um, and so uh, he wants to register that trademark and the trademark office says he can't under this uh, provision and um, he says that this provision is um, violates the First Amendment as applied to uh, him. Um, this is, and so this is the administration saying uh, he can't uh, register this. And so um, in a way, isn't it nice to have the uh, you know, Biden administration in a sense on the same side with you know, Trump, even if it's a you know, little trademark uh, case. Um, they, so they say you can't register the trademark, Trump too small, um, and uh, you know, isn't that, um, aren't they behaving consistent with their legal uh, principles? Um, this case, in a sense, um, uh, follows from two prior cases this uh, in the past decade, Matal v. Tam and Yanku v. Brunetti, both of which struck down different provisions, but neighboring provisions of the uh, Lanham Act. And so the government's problem is uh, trying to explain why this is different uh, and why, they, um, why the statute should um, survive or this provision. Um, and I think it's an uphill battle for them to uh, distinguish it. I don't think they're really going to uh, win here. One argument they try is they sort of cleverly suggest that the registering trademarks is, um, you know, it really doesn't uh, implicate the First Amendment at all quite. It's uh, really just, it's not, a, um, it's not restricting speech. It's just imposing a reasonable viewpoint neutral condition on the benefits of trademark registration. So not really quite a First Amendment case at all, but I, I think they've lost that issue already. They lost that in these prior two uh, cases. Um, and then the sort of interesting claim they make is, well, but this one's viewpoint neutral. So usually the, um, we frown on statutes that are, um, that are cont content-based restrictions on speech, but we frown even more on statutes that are uh, viewpoint-based restrictions on speech. They say, well, this one's not viewpoint-based. It's, you know, just using the name or the, um, or the portrait. And um, the, uh, the petitioner says, um, well, but, um, um, you know, even if that's so, we should win. Uh, and even if it's just content neutral, we should win or whatever. I really think they should have pressed on this a little harder. Um, it is, uh, you know, maybe in a sense viewpoint neutral, but because it has this provision about consent, I think there's some viewpoint, um, it's viewpoint non-neutral, um, 
or there's a viewpoint bias built into that consent feature, right? So if you said, um, you know, if you wanted to trademark, um, you know, Trump so huge or something, then he, he might actually grant you consent and Trump too small, he actually probably won't. And so having you embedded a kind of viewpoint into the consent um, feature um, and, uh, um, you know, or to put it another way, the person who's going to give consent doesn't have to behave in a viewpoint neutral way. And so doesn't that embed a viewpoint into the statute, I would think, um, is probably the way the court will or should uh, deal with that. The administration says one kind of clever thing. They say, well, um, restricting, actually granting the trademark is, uh, in a sense, speech restrictive, because it's stopping other people from using this same uh, trademark. So really, actually, the First Amendment interests are on the other side. We're really like, um, the, you know, by not um, registering this, there can be kind of more speech. And that's a kind of acute uh, point that doesn't really win the day. But at least it, um, it's, so from their perspective, they're able to say, um, you know, actually, We'd like more people to be able to speak and register trademarks like this, you know, Trump really small and Trump super small and Trump tiny or whatever. And so now we see actually the government's not quite really on Trump's uh, side and so all is right with the world. Um, okay, and then the other uh, set of cases I'm asked to talk about are O'Connor v. Radcliffe, Garnier v. v uh, uh, sorry, O'Connor Radcliffe v. Garnier and Linky v. Freed. These are both to be argued on the same day, October 31st. These are cases under 1983. Um, the cases are a little bit different, but the issue is basically the same. Um, whether a public official engages in state action subject to the First Amendment by blocking an individual from the official's personal social media account when the official uses the account to feature their job and communicate about job-related matters with the public. So in O'Connor Radcliffe, the, um, they are um, elected members of a uh, school board. And in the other one, it's uh, the, um, the city manager of a uh, city. And you know, from the uh, government's perspective, so the government wants to emphasize, or sorry, the, um, the, uh, the um, Garnier, the, um, sorry, O'Connor Radcliffe want to emphasize that um, these things uh, are not created by the, first of all, they're created, they were created um, uh, before these folks were elected. So they were created when they were just campaigning. Um, they were created to help them get elected and maintained to help them get reelected, and that the government exercises no control over the content of these pages, doesn't require them to be maintained, et cetera. But from the Garnier's perspective, they want to emphasize the look of the thing. So when you go to the page, it sort of says that the person's a board member and there, you know, there's a photo of the school board and there's a designation that says official, you know, government official or something. And there's a link to the official page and he gives his official email address and things like that. So, in a sense, this is the uh, kind of new context for the always puzzling problem of what hat are you wearing, right? Are you, are, are you actually functioning as a government official here? Or are you actually functioning as a private uh, person? And that's, um, can, that's sort of always been a tricky question and it's maybe tricky uh, here. Um, uh, these cases, uh, I think the government missed one in the school board case, I think they missed a bit of an opportunity um, I think they should have emphasized actually that um, the nature of the school board as a board. So I think they could have at least kind of tried to draw a line or at least a presumptive line and said, um, you know, actually a school board member doesn't really have any um, power individually, only has power as member of a board. And so he's really only functioning as a government official kind of when the board is, um, uh, is constituted, something like that. I think that might have um, resonated for the court. It's a bit like a court, right? And the justices have very little, a little bit, but very little power individually. Their power is a kind of a collective power. Um, so I'm not sure if that would have won the day, but I think it might have framed the case in a way that could have been useful for the justices um, and for, um, uh, for O'Connor uh, Radcliffe. 
Um, I think probably they're um, not going to win uh, this case. In a way, these cases are enormous because Facebook and Twitter are enormous. In a way, they're kind of trivial because they just turn on this confusion. And really, the answer in this and so many such cases ought to be clear labeling. I mean, Facebook should just have a button, which is your official government page and your personal not government page, and just say that in big letters, and then we wouldn't have this uh, problem. I'll just make one last little uh, point, and then I'll stop. Um, I'd say that case in particular has superb briefs on all sides, so everything was really well written and a pleasure to read, including I like to call out as a law professor excellent work by Pam Carlin and the Stanford Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. I was surprised, though, to read these sentences in her brief or in their brief, uh, quote, in, and this is by way of saying the, um, the posts look like government posts. In their posts, the trustees often use the collective pronouns we and our to refer to actions by the district and school employees. It's difficult to imagine those collective pronouns refer to anything other than official PUSD leadership. I guess I'd just say it's nice to know that out at Stanford, these pronouns are so well defined, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> at uh, Georgetown, I myself would not dare to hazard a guess what they might refer to. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I also appreciate that you came prepared. If anyone has any questions about footnotes or otherwise, he has all of the briefs here to, to reference. So I'm expecting some really good questions out of you guys at the end. Um, Erin Hawley, thank you for joining us. Uh, she is at the Alliance Defending Freedom and also a professor at Regent University. And you got our grab bag today, but a really fun grab bag. I'm very into all three of these. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah, and to the Federal Society. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, I've got a grab bag of cases, um, and I will save the most interesting, the tax case, uh, for last. Um, I know you will be on pins and needles. Uh, so to start with, um, Atchison Hotels. Um, Atchison Hotels um, is a fascinating case, both for its substance and sort of the procedural nuances that have bubbled up uh, since CERT was granted. Uh, so in Atchison, it's filed under the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and there's this sort of cottage industry of having so-called testers who will look at websites for public accommodations like hotels, um, especially little hotels who may not have their website up to date. Um, and these websites are, or excuse me, these hotels are required under the ADA to specify certain information uh, that must be available as to accommodations. Um, so our plaintiff in this case, Lawfer, uh, went to the website. Uh, there was not the required information as to accommodations. And so she files a lawsuit, uh, one of 600 lawsuits uh, filed by this particular plaintiff um, uh, uh, as a self-appointed tester. Um, so the Supreme Court um, is asked to take the case. Uh, the fir first, I should start, I guess, with the district court. And the district court says, you know, I'm sorry, you don't have standing. Um, you're not injured by the absence of information uh, on a website for a place you never intend to visit. Sounds a lot like Lujan. Um, the First Circuit, on the other hand, reverses and says, well, there's this case called Haven's Realty. Um, and Haven's Realty says that an informational injury is enough when that information is required by the statute. And the First Circuit sort of recognizes the tension with a later case called TransUnion, which really cast doubt on informational injuries, um, but went on to say, well, maybe there's follow-on effects from informational injuries that can be enough for standing. So the First Circuit recognizes this tension and says that, uh, let's see, Laffer's feelings of frustration, humiliation, and second-class citizenry uh, are downstream consequences and adverse effects of the informational injury. So in the First Circuit's view, that was enough for Article III standing. So, not surprisingly, uh, Atchison Hotel petitions for cert, um, and I just think this had to be fun, such a fun petition to write um, because not only was there a three-six circuit split, so definite circuit split, um, but there was a circuit split from the same plaintiff. There were <laughs> courts in opposite <laughs> circuits that had had the almost identical complaints filed by Mrs. Laufer, um, and so so a pretty clear circuit split. Uh, hard, hard to beat that. Um, so the Supreme Court takes the case, um, and then we get another sort of procedural wrinkle. Um, the uh, plaintiff in the case at the time uh, acknowledged the circuit split, uh, said that the Supreme Court should take the case to clarify the issue of law. Um, but then a few months go by and her attorney gets in hot water with the disciplinary board for not communicating with clients and, and all sorts of things. 
and so she gets new counsel at the Supreme Court. Well, the new counsel sees perhaps the writing on the wall um, and files a, a motion uh, with the Supreme Court to dismiss the case as moot. Uh, Ms. Slaughter does not want the merits of the case to get sort of tied up with the disciplinary actions of her former attorney, so has dismissed the case at the district court. Um, the Supreme Court has taken no action, uh, I think perhaps because in that filing, a uh, new counsel for Ms. Laffer admits that both mootness and jurisdictional questions, uh, excuse me, and standing are both jurisdictional inquiries, and the court has discretion as to which case or which issue to take up first. Um, given that the Supreme Court does not like to dismiss cases as improvidently granted, I suspect that they will choose to take up the standing question first, um, and we will resolve the circuit split involving Mrs. Laffer on, on both sides of the circuit split. So, so interesting, both procedural and, and sort of substantially as to what Article Three standing uh, requires. Uh, the second case I've been asked to discuss is the Purdue case, so a bankruptcy case. So, so I've got standing, bankruptcy, and tax, but, but don't worry, <laughs> they're, they're actually quite interesting. Um, and we actually do Purdue like Aaron, that wasn't punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do love them. <laughs> um, but with the Purdue case, uh, again, sort of, uh, you can't make these types of facts up. Uh, it involves the opioid crisis that, of course, has taken some 247,000 lives. Uh, there were claims filed against both Purdue and its controlling family, the Sackler family. Um, I think those claims were valued at something like $40 trillion. Um, so in, in the meantime, uh, the Sacklers, again, the controlling family, take about $11 billion out of the company Purdue, um, and then Purdue files for bankruptcy. So we have a four-year proceeding to sort of get to the bottom of uh, who Purdue owes what, um, comes away with the Sacklers sort of putting the $6 billion back into the reorganization, the, the bankruptcy, um, and, and everyone's happy. The, the 50 states who are all plaintiffs are happy. The District of Columbia is happy. The, the plaintiffs in the case are happy. Uh, so end of story, right? Except uh, the United States trustee is not happy. Uh, so the United States, States trustee files a motion for stay um, that they say should also be interpreted as a petition for cert uh, on the question of whether non-debtors uh, can be absolved from liability through a bankruptcy proceeding. So what happened was the bankruptcy court said, um, we're not only going to absolve Purdue as the bankrupt debtor, um, we're also going to cut up all liability uh, to the Sackler family itself. So that's what uh, sort of upset uh, the, the administration. Uh, so the Supreme Court took the question um, as to whether a non-debtor can be absolved under the bankruptcy code. Um, in looking at um, the, the court's approval of this, the court relied on two provisions of the bankruptcy code. Um, the first one is 11 U.S.C. section 105A. Um, those of you who have dabbled in bankruptcy law know it comes up all of the time because it presumably gives a lot of authority. Um, it says the bankruptcy court may issue any order, process, or judgment that is, quote, necessary or appropriate to carry out the provisions of this code. So basically, go, go forth and do good, uh, so long as it's necessary. Um, and then the second provision says, uh, a plan may include any other appropriate provision not inconsistent with the applicable provisions of this code. So cobbled together, uh, the bankruptcy court, and as approved by the district court, uh, and the court of appeals said those two provisions uh, gave the uh, bankruptcy court the authority to release non-debtors from cl future claims even though those same non-debtors would not have been able to be absolved in bankruptcy. Um, sort of a, a nuance, but if you have a fraud claim, that fraud claim cannot be extinguished in bankruptcy. Uh, there are fraud claims against the Sacklers. So if the Sacklers had been in bankruptcy, these claims could not have been extinguished. Um, also a circuit split uh, in this case. The 5th, 9th, and 10th uh, say that uh, third-party claims cannot be um, barred against non-debtors. Uh, Sixth Circuit say that they can be in some circumstances. Um, I think maybe a clue as to why the court took uh, cert in this case, uh, the, the lower circuit court came up with seven factors um, to determine whether or not uh, this was permissible. Uh, I, I don't think seven factors is probably a good strategy, um, but, but we'll see. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to note is that the U.S. trustee uses constitutional avoidance at the end of their brief um, to argue, you know, this is a close question. We have due process rights, at least we know in this class action contest, that you cannot uh, cut off claims of parties without notice. That's precisely what's happening here. Um, so out of constitutional avoidance, maybe we should not interpret the bankruptcy code to allow anything not inconsistent uh, with said code. 
So we will see. Um, but but my, my vote is not on seven factors. Uh, <laughs> so And the last one, I, I know you all are waiting for Moore versus United States. Um, so Moore versus United States is a fantastic case for anyone that has a remote or passing interest in tax law. And because that is every brief and every decision in this case actually cites um, Helvering versus Horst. Uh, they go all the way back to Glenshaw Glass, those very first uh, tax cases in your tax textbook. Um, and, and they come up with the very basic question of what is a direct tax uh, and what is income. Uh, the facts of this case come out of the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017, uh, in which uh, Congress modified Subpart H, which uh, governs foreign uh, income. And uh, Congress said in that act that there was a mandatory repatriation. That means that if you owned a, at least a 10% interest in a foreign company, um, that foreign company had gains, you got to park it there forever uh, and never get income tax. Um, and in 2017, Congress said, no, not really. We're going to have you bring it back over. We're going to repatriate it. You're going to have sort of forced uh, realization, and you're going to pay income tax on that amount, uh, albeit at, at a very uh, low rate. Um, so the Moors are very sympathetic uh, plaintiffs. They own, I think, a 13% interest in an Indian company that gives uh, farming equipment uh, to sort of impoverished areas. Um, they've never gotten any dividends um, from their ownership in this company. It's just been sort of something they've invested in. Uh, for the good uh, of, of the Indian farmers and Indian uh, citizenry, um, and yet they're hit with a $15,000 tax bill. Uh, so they take this case all the way up to the Supreme Court, arguing that it is a direct tax uh, on uh, property um, and that um, it cannot be income unless there is realization. So there's really sort of two conflicting lines of Supreme Court authority. On the one hand, you have Glenshaw Glass, uh, again, back in those text, tax textbooks, and Glenshaw Glass says that you have to have a clearly defined accretion to income that is clearly realized. So that means if you have a crop, uh, it's growing, that's not income. If you cut off the heads of the corn and sell it, uh, that's income, but it has to be clearly realized. Um, on the other hand, you've got a couple of cases, um, and they are um, Helvering versus Brune and Heiner versus Mellon. And these cases say that for partnership taxation, um, it doesn't have to be received in the year in which it's distributed. Um, you can still have pass-through taxation, even if the partnership still keeps that money. Um, so that seems to suggest realization is not required. Um, so, so you've got these two conflicting lines of authority. Um, of course, it goes back, I should have mentioned, to the 16th Amendment, um, which allows for the taxation of income. So the question here is, um, is it income where there has been no dividend, where there's been no realization? Um, and then the last thing I will note is that history could have uh, something really interesting to say. At the Ninth Circuit, Judge Bumate uh, wrote a dissent from en banc review, and, and he pointed to Black's Law Dictionary um, and other uh, dictionaries at the source at the time of the 16th Amendment, and those definitions seem to suggest that income does, in fact, uh, encompass this ideal of realization. So we will see, um, but perhaps another case uh, in which the court will take a deep dive into originalism um, and history, um, even though we've got sort of these conflicting lines of authority. Um, and the last thing to emphasize is that this case is not about a wealth tax um, or a property tax. It's about taxing the, the, the gain. Um, made on, on capital. Um, but it could have a lot to say about partnership taxation, trusts and beneficiaries, uh, mark to market for futures contracts, um, and subpart S corporations. So a tax case, um, but, but I submit it will be a very interesting one to see what the court does. Finally, the bankruptcy and tax nerds get their day. They are the popular kids. Um, in my household, by the way, my father is a bankruptcy judge. I have been trying to hold him unconstitutional uh, since I was clerking. I wrote a little draft <laughs> opinion. I did. This is not a joke. I wrote a draft opinion for Edith Jones. It was three pages, finding uh, the bankruptcy courts unconstitutional. She thought maybe it needed a little broader. Um, <laughs> But, but look, you can look at it either way. I'm being an unloyal daughter, disloyal daughter, by finding him unconstitutional, or I'm just trying to get him that Article Three status. You don't, you know, could go either way. Uh, Jeff Rosen is here with us. He is the president of the National Constitution Center, and he is going to bring the fastball on the voting cases. Absolutely. Um, it is so wonderful, first of all, to be here with my old friends, Gene Meyer and Lee Otis and Dean Reuter and all of my great 
fe uh, fellow panelists. And thank you for asking me to discuss breaking news, because just this morning, the Supreme Court unanimously, uh, well, let me read from the Wall Street Journal accounts. The Supreme Court this morning rejected Alabama's bid to maintain white majorities in six of its seven congressional districts, leaving intact lower court findings that the Voting Rights Act required the state to provide black Alabamians an opportunity to elect their preferred candidates for two US House seats. Tuesday's brief and unsigned order included no dissents. So this um, could have been the most important voting rights case of the year, the fact that the court unanimously uh, upheld the lower court's order to create a second black majority district in Alabama suggests that although the case last term, Allen against Milligan was five to four, the court viewed the effort by the Alabama legislature to refuse to create a second black district as an open defiance of the court's decision and therefore refused to countenance it. I would like now, uh, for my own sake as well as yours, to try to state as concisely as I can how we got from the original um, uh, Mobile case, which arose out of Alabama, to this Allen and Milligan case, because it involves a profound question, which is contested on the court, about whether or not Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is itself unconstitutional or not. And essentially, the court held last term, five to four, uh, without being explicit, uh, four justices are inclined to hold that to the degree that Section 2 requires legislators to be race conscious in voting districts to allow minorities to elect representatives of their choice, it is, uh, it does violate the 14th Amendment. And uh, the court, however, by a, uh, five justices, including Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh, joined uh, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan and, and Brown Jackson in holding that Section 2 is not unconstitutional and reaffirmed the famous Jingles test. And um, I, I, again, just to get it straight in our minds, the Jingles test says, when a minority group is sufficiently large and compact to constitute a majority in a reasonably configured district, sec when the, second, when the minority group shows it's politically cohesive, and third, when it can demonstrate that the white majority votes sufficiently as a block to defeat the minority's preferred candidate, you have a presumption that a new district is required. And the court um, uh, reaffirmed the Jingles test and he here held that the black community was sufficiently compact, there was a history of racially polarized block voting, and therefore another district was required. But let's just, this, this um, stuff is hard to teach and it's hard to explain. Let's see if I can do it. So, so how did we get here? I'll, and I'll, and we, you know, in four minutes. Um, <laughs> no, white versus register uh, back in the 60s held that um, when uh, it was okay for a lower court to say that you had to have a single member district in uh, Texas because uh, multi-member districts diluted black votes and made it impossible for black people to elect representatives of their choice. In the Mobile case in Alabama, the court reversed that and said you have to have intentional racial discrimination. It doesn't matter if the voting system has the effect of making it harder for black people to elect their preferred candidates without evidence of intent. Uh, there's no constitutional violation. Congress reversed that, and in one of the biggest debates of the 1980s, uh, Republicans joined with Democrats in a compromise brokered by Edward Kennedy and, and Robert Dole, and said that, uh, resurrected the intent test, and said that when minorities have it, find it harder to elect representatives of their choice, when there's a history of racially polarized block voting, then um, uh, the Voting Rights Act requires uh, that districts be created for them. But there was a caveat, that we're not requiring proportional representation, which seemed like the only uh, clear baseline for when there's vote dilution. So that was a real dilemma. How do you both uh, create enough districts to ensure that black people can elect representatives of their choice but not have proportional representation? Congress never solved that question. So th th all these, uh, fast forward to last term, Allen and Milligan, um, same state, Alabama, uh, Alabama is, uh, um, the legislators are refusing to create a voting district for black people, saying essentially that you have to be colorblind in districting and that the relevant baseline is whether a racially neutral map could be created. Um, and if the district that's proposed compares favorably with 
hypothetical racially neutral maps, basically on the ground that the Constitution severely disfavors race consciousness in voting um, map drawing. That was based on a conclusion which was implicit but not explicitly stated in the briefing that Section 2 itself is unconstitutional to the degree that it requires legislators to be race conscious in allowing representatives to elect uh, those of their choice. And that's what Justice Thomas held in his dissent. He said, essentially, that the 14th Amendment is colorblind and uh, any attempts to remedy first order discrimination have to have a stopping point. And in the affirmative action cases, we said it was 25 years. And therefore, to the degree that Section 2 requires race consciousness, it's unconstitutional. And then he construed it not to require the creation of additional districts, even though Congress clearly meant for that to happen. So Justice Thomas was questioning the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. So the big question, friends, is whether um, Justice Kavanaugh will go along with this. And in his concurrence, he joined the majority, but he said, we said in the affirmative action cases, maybe there's a 25-year time limit. And here, the plaintiffs didn't argue that maybe there was a time limit. Uh, but, you know, come back to me. And that's why the Alabama legislature over the, uh, the summer um, declined to create a new district because they were trying to flip Justice Kavanaugh and said, you know, there's a time limit. And I guess it was expired over the summer or something like that. It began to, <laughs> began to toll in, in June and it was gone in, in July. But they said the, t the time has ended and we're not going to create the district. But it's, a, it's just a profound clash of philosophies about whether or not you think the 14th Amendment is colorblind and whether essentially Section 2 is constitutional or not. I have to add, because it's the Federalist Society, my um, uh, uh, conviction, because I think this is a consensus among 14th Amendment scholars, the 14th Amendment, as originally understood, wasn't intended to apply to voting rights. It covered civil rights, but not political rights, as Justice Harlan, you're, you're nodding, you know this. This is a problem. Justice Harlan and Reynolds v. Sims gives all the evidence. If you're, if you're not convinced by this, just look at Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which says we understand that legislators might violate voting rights. That's not inconsistent with the 14th Amendment. But if they do that, the remedy is a proportional reduction in the congressional apportionment. There was an effort to make the 14th Amendment cover voting rights, but the, right, the votes weren't there. You can look at the early drafts of the 14th Amendment on the National Constitution Center's amazing interactive constitution, which has the early drafts where John Bingham stands up and says, we want to ban discrimination in voting, and the votes aren't there, which is why you have to go to the 15th Amendment. So maybe this is just me in my NCC and you know, law professor hat, but it seems like a challenge, shall we say, for originalists and textualists to explain why it is that the 14th Amendment, which obviously was not intended to as a textual original matter, apply to voting rights, in fact, bans all color consciousness in voting districts. And if you go to the 15th Amendment, um, it's a whole different text and a different remedial scheme, which is why White v. Register, to go back to the beginning of our story, originally said it was fine to prevent abridgments of the right to vote under the 14th Amendment by prohibiting schemes that had discriminatory effects as well as intents. All right, that was my best effort at it. It's a completely fascinating uh, series of cases. We won't have the court hear them this year because they just unanimously declined to weigh in. But um, stay tuned about whether or not the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. And my second case, which the court has agreed to hear it, I'll just put on the table more um, quickly. And that is uh, a case involving um, Alexander versus South Carolina. And here, uh, the South Carolina legislature created a redistricting map which had the effect of moving tens of thousands of black voters out of a swing district. And the question is, is, is that an impermissible racial gerrymander? The legislators say it's just a political gerrymander. Yes, we literally carved all the black voters out of Charleston in order to flip Charleston and make it a Republican district. And they don't deny that they were doing that but they say the effort was a, the political effort of uh, increasing incumbency protection and electing Republicans, and the intent was not to um, harm black people. And this is another fascinating clash of a couple lines of cases. On the one hand, the NAACP, which is challenging this uh, as a racial gerrymander, a classic example of cracking or packing <coughs> uh, districts, says, this is a totally non-contiguous district. It looks as crazy as the district in Shaw v. Reno, where someone said, if you drew, 
drove up the district with the car doors open, you'd kill everyone in the district because it was this <laughs> really thin district with little uh, arms on either side. And here you can't drive from Sullivan Island in the northeast to James in the southwest without going through the district that was cut off. And for the first time, uh, you have to cut across four bridges to get there. It's scattered chunks and shards. That No one's denying that the it, it was an effort to exclude black voters from Charleston. And the um, NAACP says that um, sh uh, um, you, you can't crack and pack in these ways. It's clear racial sorting. They note that Shaw v. Reno says you don't even need evidence of discriminatory intent that as, if the effect is to uh, completely engage in a racial gerrymander, then the district is presumptively unconstitutional and they say that this violates Shaw as well as possibly cases like the Tuskegee case. Remember back in the 60s when Tuskegee literally cracked the black voters out of Tuskegee in order to not allow them to vote in that election. And the defenders cite the Cromartie case, which said that when there's a mixed evidence of political and racial gerrymanders, then the district is presumptively okay. And if you're gonna challenge the racial gerrymander, you have to show that there's an alternative map that could have achieved the same political result without as much racial gerrymandering. And here they say this was the only way to guarantee the political result they wanted, and therefore it is um, permissible under the Cromartie case. So really two separate lines of cases. One, Shaw saying appearances matter. Remember Justice O'Connor saying when the districts look really weird in their shape, there's a presumption that race for its own sake was the main factor and therefore um, the district is presumptively unconstitutional. And cases like Cromartie that say in cases of mixed motive, both political and racial, um, we're going to be deferential to the political goal unless there's a clear racial alternative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the most fun parts about seeing uh, Jeff ever talk is that his hand gestures are directly proportional to his passion and love of the topic. So if his hands are down, he's bored, move on. You ask a bad <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, Jen Mascot, thank you for joining us. Jen is uh, the you know, co-executive co director of the Boyd and Gray Center for the Administrative State. Uh, nope, nope. For the Administrative State? For the study. Ah. Oh, okay. Oh, no, but that's directly on point, directly on point with the topic for today. <laughs> and a professor at George Mason University. She got our other nerd uh, grab bag of sorts, Chevron, CFPB, the SEC. Um, very exciting. And for those who drove here up 17th, you drove right past the CFPB's home and its odd a decorative scheme, which feels like they thought they'd been around since 1978-ish, sort of those brownish tones, the bubbly letters. It was strange. Yeah. Well, this is, so this term, administrative law professor's dream, as Sarah points out, so three cases today, just to give you a top level of what they're about. So Consumer Financial Protection Bureau versus Community Financial Services Association essentially um, is reviewing whether the funding structure of the CFPB is unconstitutional in violation of the appropriations clause. So that could have some significant implications. Then we've got Jarcusy, uh, SEC versus Jarcusy, which has three constitutional questions, violation of a right to jury trial, delegation issue, and then removal scheme of agency adjudicators. And then we have the constitutionality of Chevron deference, the greatly loved or hated Chevron deference at stake. So there's a lot going on already in a term that only has, do we have 30 some cases? 23. 23. No way. Really? Wow. Okay. So it's even more significant than I, than I, than I um, would have initially thought. So I will run through the cases in more depth, but I was talking to um, a reporter earlier this week who was um, asking me a couple of thematic questions. So I think I'll just raise them here because maybe it ties together some themes of the term. And so the first question of this indiv individual posed to me was whether I saw trends in uh, or changes in how the court is looking at administrative action over the years. And I think generally the court actually for decades does has been taking a significant look 
look at various types of agency action simply because, as you know, we can know and watch over time, executive agencies exercise a lot of power. And so the court, if there's a significant structural constitutional claim made by parties, um, we'll take a close look at the structure of agencies and the power that they exercise. I do think there might be a bit of a shift uh, this term, not in just the kind of claims that we're looking at. Often the big cases we've seen in the past few years have been more about supervisory structure. Is someone unconstitutionally appointed uh, or there is the ability to fire them by the president um, to constrain? And so some of the big cases recently have been about um, executive supervision and so the hierarchy within the executive branch itself. These cases are getting at um, arguably more systemic questions even about how Congress and the executive branch interact and the substance and form of how agencies are acting. And also some of these cases are giving the court to take a look at doctrines that in the past it really has sort of chosen not to take a real trenchant look at, like Chevron deference, delegation, jury trial rights, the court sort of considered and kind of decided not to not to weigh in that much recently uh, and so we'll see if they if they take a different tack this term on um, the other point that was raised to me is did this seem to be the term of reviewing the fifth circuit and maybe the fifth circuit's just too forward leaning and so that's why we have all these interesting cases and I push back on that a little bit as well because I, obviously you know litigants have to bring they are sometimes choosing to bring their cases in the fifth circuit but litigants are feeling regulated by agencies agencies are taking big action so they're bringing the big constitutional claims. And actually, um, somebody can correct my uh, count on this if it's wrong, but I think the Fifth Circuit is being has its decisions being reviewed in four of the cases this term, and the Third Circuit also is making an appearance four times. So um, two of the cases I'm going to talk about are coming up through the Fifth Circuit. One is coming up through the D.C. Circuit. Um, the Fifth Circuit cases are interesting, CFPB, Appropriations Clause, and Jarcusy versus SEC, because sometimes those who like to read the tea leaves and predict in advance how the court's going to rule will say, well, they would not have taken the case if they didn't think there was a problem and it was going to come out X way and there's a constitutional violation. But here, the Fifth Circuit is, is, the, is the court that issued the rulings finding the various constitutional violations in Jarcusy versus SEC, three of them. And so I don't think the court's review of it is sadly nearly as predictive as we might think in other circumstances where the ruling is reversed. Um, but I do think the court will take a close look. So what's the appropriations clause issue with CFPB? Well, the CFPB, as many of you might know, basically gets its funding um, through a process that is not subject to annual appropriations review. And so the funding's coming from Federal Reserve funds themselves. And so if I can just be really nerdy and look at the uh, statutory provision, 12 U.S.C. 54, Section 5497, each year, each quarter, the Board of Governors shall transfer to the Bureau from the earnings of the Federal Reserve System the amount determined by the director of the CFPB to be reasonably necessary to carry out the authorities of the Bureau. So if you're looking at this on the surface and trying to issue spot, and then you also understand the Constitution has something to say about appropriations, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Right, so typically legislation, House and Senate working together, presidential signature or veto override, get together to, uh, to authorize the expenditure of appropriations. So is there a clear violation there? Because here, where's the money coming from? It's coming from the Federal Reserve System earnings, <coughs> and it's being given out in perpetuity based on the amount determined by the director of the CFPB to be reasonably necessary. So has the Congress that enacted 12 U.S.C. Section 5497 improperly taken away from future Congresses the ability or the control over appropriating funds? Well. A number of members seem to think um, that it does, perhaps, there have been a lot of amicus briefs filed in the case, one um, with uh, our Gray <coughs> Center um, clinic director who I see here today, Trent McCotter, uh, on behalf of 132 members of Congress who think that there is a violation. Um, obviously, the litigators here, they are, it, the, the, the primary party bringing the case does as well. Um, and so some members of Congress perhaps are concerned about their own prerogatives. Others on the other side, as a policy matter, are going to find differently. What are the real constitutional issues at stake? What are some of the briefs saying? What might the court look at? Well, um, you know, one challenge, obviously, for the, challenge, for the challengers is that 
you know, 12 U.S.C. Section 5497 itself is a law. So, you know, in some way, there's been a law and appropriations are being made in consequence of it. So is there something about this law that looks different from the law that we would have thought under Article 1, Section 9 needs to be passed to constitute a law uh, under which appropriations are made? Well, maybe, maybe there's an issue, you know, some of the claims being made or that it's, that it's, it's the um, ongoing nature of it. It's the fact that it's coming out of the earnings of the Federal Reserve System. Perhaps I'd be interested, I, I don't know that the lead brief focuses on this extra question as much. Would the court find that um, this particular exercise of appropriations authority bleeds into another constitutional issue where there's too much discretion here being exercised because the director has to determine, determine what's reasonably necessary to carry out the authorities of the Bureau? So you start to say, even though this is a law and it authorizes the appropriation, um, you know, is there a question about all of the steps that have to take place somewhat automatically and involve decision makers other than Congress? And so the lead brief in the case, Challenger's brief, Noel Francisco's brief, talks a lot about the prerogative of members of Congress. And, you know, there was a, many, many major constitutional um, objectives that are at stake here in wanting to make sure that when funds are, are spent and this uh, powers exercise that it's being done people with electoral accountability. And you look over at the CFPB and you can see um, how different the exercise of authority there looks than authority carried out by um, officials who are responsible to the uh, to the electorate. Okay, so that's the that's the that's the key constitutional claim there. SEC versus Jarkissi raises three claims that are basically coming up in the context of securities fraud regulations and the fact that agencies not only can make um, broad and burdensome regulations, depending on your view, but also can adjudicate and impose penalties for the violation of those regulations. And so essentially uh, what's happening in Jarkissi and the Fifth Circuit found unconstitutional, the in-house by the SEC imposition of civil penalties on a regulated party. And so um, the Dodd-Frank Act essentially expanded the power of the agency, not just to to um, try to enforce um, violations of its regulations in an Article III court, but to give a little bit more um, or significantly broader power to bring those charges and adjudicate them in-house. And so the, uh, the, and this was found by the Fifth Circuit with a dissent, but um, they found three constitutional violations there. Number one, that the fact that it's being adjudicated within the SEC in general is violating the right to a jury trial because this is the kind of action at law that would have been heard uh, in a court with Article III protection subject to a potential jury trial right. And that there's a delegation problem because um, the, the, the statutes do not give any real clear standard, or really if you read them, it's any standard at all um, for the agency to use to determine whether it's going to first adjudicate and impose the penalty itself or take it to an Article III court. So uh, those of you who follow administrative law, maybe not many of you, maybe, maybe some do, uh, the court in the past has been really hesitant to look at uh, more um, to, to look too closely or to impose a burdensome standard on this delegation claim. So the idea is Congress is in charge of making legislations. If it delegates too broad power to agency authority, to agencies, it's letting them impose legislative um, responsibilities and burdens, not uh, Congress itself. The standard has been, however, up until now, that so long as there's an intelligible principle given by Congress to the agency, there's no violation of the delegation limitation. Now, there are some justices who to strongly resist that standard. In particular, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas have written a lot, thinking that the standard needs to be more readily and clearly applied. But the court um, has had the opportunity, even in the last five years, to look at the claims and has not uh, so far gotten a majority to really tighten that standard. Here, it's coming up in a slightly different way. It's not a delegation of authority to impose a policy standard. It's actually a delegation of authority to choose a manner of enforcing claims. And so will this um, application of the broad delegation of enforcement authority here and the, the choice there without a statutory standard governing how to choose one from the other be something that um, 
that triggers the court to take a closer look at that, at that delegation standard. And then the final um, problem is that these in-house adjudicators are protected with tenure protection. So you can only fire an administrative law judge for a cause. And so if one is going to, if the court were gonna more broadly adopt rules in the past of finding that there can't be double four cause removal protections, in this system you arguably have three layers, four maybe, of four cause removal protections because you've got the SEC commissioners themselves, you've got the administrative law judges, and then the administrative law judges could adjudicate their firing or their disciplinary actions before the Merit Systems Protection Board, which itself has uh, members who are subject to a layer of four cause removal protection. So there's three opportunities there for this procedure to, within the SEC, and enforcement proceedings to be found unconstitutional. Um, and then the final case came up through the DC Circuit, Loper Bright Enterprises, and you know it offers an opportunity to the court to find that the Chevron deference doctrine is unconstitutional, and I'll just be brief because I know we're running out of time and you all probably know what that is, but the idea that if there's ambiguity in a statutory scheme, that the courts will give deference to administrative agencies and how they select among a range of possible interpretations. And so for many years, there have been many litigants who have brought the claim that this is an unconstitutional, either an unconstitutional way in uh, which the court um, gives deference and should instead be interpreting the law itself, so it's a problem with separation of powers, or you might say that it's unlawful because it violates the review scheme that was put in place by the Administrative Procedure Act. So that's arguably a more modest claim. There could be a statutory problem that perhaps the APA requires um, legal questions to be reviewed de novo or evaluated de novo by courts and not given a deference to agencies. So on either ground that the Chevron Doctrine is just um, in tension with the APA or the Constitution or both. Uh, will the court actually take that up? I mean, what it's been doing recently, it's been a long time, really, since the courts um, applied Chevron deference to an agency action, which would essentially mean saying, we think the agency might be doing something unlawful, but we're not going to really hold its feet to the fire because we're going to give its deference. Usually the court isn't deciding one way or the other about whether, or, or opining clearly about whether the Chevron deference scheme is unconstitutional. What it's been doing is it's been taking the approach of just more closely doing the statutory interpretation itself. So looking closely enough at the statutory scheme to determine that the agency action's unlawful because it doesn't, it's not authorized under the statutory scheme, and therefore the court doesn't have to opine on the greater question. Um, I think Paul Clement, in writing, if I can find where in my stack here, I have it, in writing his question for the court to review, really does try to get them to squarely look at the, um, whether there needs to be an overruling of Chevron. However, he also gave them a back door. So the question presented is whether the court should overrule Chevron. Could have stopped there where they have taken it. Who knows? Probably. Anyway, but whether the court should overrule Chevron or at least clarify that statutory silence concerning controversial powers expressly but narrowly granted elsewhere in the statute does not constitute an ambiguity requiring deference to the agency. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's enough packed into that last part there that it would indeed be simpler this time just to answer the question whether the court needs to overrule Chevron, but there's an out there for the a client to win the case, whether they do or not. Um, I, think, I think the court, or at least some members, will address that question square on, um, but we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see. So there's a lot there, and, and really all of these questions um, actually are independently, I think, um, arguably of really significant import about just the constitutionality of how um, a branch of government that has many, many agencies engaging in many, many different areas of authority operates. And I would imagine um, at least one or two of these cases will lead to quite significant, interesting rulings. All right, well, as my torts professor would say, now we have the hit parade cases, uh, the gun cases of this term. Robert joins us from George Mason University as well, expert in the area. Rahimi, bump stocks, this is where the sex appeal really hits at the Supreme Court this term. <laughs> All right, yeah, so I have guns, and uh, I think one of these is the Second Amendment case. The bump stocks uh, aren't really. All right, so in New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, the court established a text history and tradition test for the, se for the Second Amendment claims. 
court said first, determine whether conduct falls within the plain meaning of the Second Amendment. And if it does, uh, then the conduct's presumptively protected and the burden shifts back to the government uh, to explain why the law is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of regulating firearm ownership. And to do this, the court explained, judges will need to engage in analogical reasoning to determine whether modern regulations are relevantly similar uh, to regulations that existed at the framing. Now, the court's invocation of historical analogies has produced both uh, confusion and criticism. So when a regulation is challenged, many lower courts have construed the Supreme Court's test to require them to determine whether the framing generation had an identical or nearly identical regulation. Uh, but many modern regulations have no direct framing error analog. Uh, the framing generation regulated guns very little. Uh, judges have also objected just to the burdens of trying to mine the historical record, and they lament that they are not historians. And of course, relevant similarity exists on a spectrum for which judges have drawn highly variant conclusions. And so for this and for many other reasons, a uh, number of people, both judges and scholars, have criticized the Supreme Court's test as ill-defined and unworkable. So at this point, cue Rahimi. So the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit's having its moment uh, this term, invalidated Section 922 G8, which provides that, uh, it, that it is a, federal is a federally prohibiting factor to possess a firearm when the person is under a domestic violence restraining order. And the Fifth Circuit facially invalidated it because there was no framing error analog to it. The framing error, you know, there were provisions for domestic abuse in the framing error, but it was not, uh, it did not involve disarmament of the individual who was involved. And so, again, this case is a facial challenge, and the nominal question in this case is whether the federal ban on gun possession by a person under a domestic violence restraining order is constitutional. But just like the nominal party is often not the real party in interest, the nominal question here is not the real legal question. Uh, the real legal question that everyone's interested in with Rahimi is to see how the court clarifies and applies the text, history, and tradition test that it had announced two terms ago in Bruin. And unquestionably, the government sought review in this case to water down the test. Uh, the government asked the court to expedite Rahimi. It contended the decision would sow chaos into the federal scheme for enforcing uh, gun laws. Meanwhile, at the same time, it asked the court for an extension to decide whether to appeal a Third Circuit en banc ruling, uh, which sustained an as-applied challenge to the federal in possession uh, scheme. And that case involved somebody with a nearly 30-year-old conviction for minor welfare fraud. That's a hard case. Here, and moreover, the damage to federal, to federal prosecutions is orders of magnitude higher in the federal felon in possession cases. Felon in possession cases, just felon in possession with no other conduct, you know, as, just as the lead charge. That accounts for about five to 6,000 cases a year uh, in the federal criminal docket. It is a major source just by itself of federal prosecutions. Domestic violence restraining order cases take about 30 cases a year in the federal docket. Totally insignificant. So why was the government so eager to bring this case? Well, for that, Let's go to the facts of the case from the Fifth Circuit. And I'm just going to read a couple sentences from the Fifth Circuit's opinion. As the Fifth Circuit describes it, between December 2020 and January 2021, Rahimi was involved in five shootings in and around Arlington, Texas. On December 1st, after selling narcotics to an individual, he fired multiple shots into the individual's residence. The following day, he was involved in a car accident and exited his vehicle and shot at the other driver and fled the scene. He returned to the scene in a different vehicle and shot at that other driver's car. So Mr. Rahimi is the poster child for irresponsible gun possession. 
And I think the government wanted this case and not the welfare fraud case because it views this case as much easier on the judgment line. Even though as far as the day-to-day -day business is concerned, uh, the felon in possession cases are much more significant. So judgment line aside, the real issue here is how are they going to apply the uh, text, history, and tradition test. That is a hard question. There are a lot of problems here. Number one, there's a level of generality problem. So Justice Barrett, when she was Judge Barrett on the Seventh Circuit, had a dissent in Canner where she argued that framing error analogs contained a general principle that the government can disarm those who are dangerous. And I expect some version of that line of thought will be present here. Uh, but that is, in a way, to take a very generic count of text history and tradition. Many of those framing error analogs uh, involve the war powers disarming loyalists during the Revolutionary War, which in many ways was the first civil war, uh, or disarming Native Americans for whom, you know, who were both not part of the people as that was originally understood, and for whom, again, there were war power considerations, uh, but not just for general dangerousness. Uh, on the other hand, there were surety laws, which, uh, you know, justices of the peace had tremendous power at common law, and one of the things they could do is bind over those who were dangerous, and they would either have to go basically go out on bail, or if they didn't post bail, they would sit in jail for six months. And the court may say, well, look, that's a close enough analog, you know, we're not making them sit in jail, but we are going to uh, take their guns away. Now, I will say that 922 G8 is the most tailored of the federal disqualifiers for gun ownership. Uh, it exists as long as there is a domestic violence restraining order and it expires at the end of the restraining order. The other factors are more problematic. Uh, you have a felon in possession ban, the felon in possession ban where I think the real action is because that is you know, a huge percentage of the federal court docket. And the issue with the felon in possession ban is that the modern definition of a felony has no resemblance to the common law definition. It's distorted by the growth of regulatory offenses and by sentencing guidelines, where the theoretical statutory maximum uh, in the statute has no basis, uh, has no bearing on what people actually get. You know, you get people like Felicity Huffman, who could theoretically have served decades in prison, who get 14 days. Uh, and I think just in general, the definition of crime punishable by more than one year has no common law origins itself. It was just sort of creeps in there and uh, has been watered down by the inflation. You know, Congress always loves to boost the statutory maximum, whether it boosts the guidelines or not. So you have a felon in possession statute that covers anything from major felonies to things that are really, really trivial offenses in the scheme of things. Uh, it's hugely overbroad, uh, and the same with the other disqualifying factors. Uh, you know, the ban on people who are mentally ill uh, goes in the label, the somewhat offensive label, as those who are adjudicated as mental defectives uh, or who are otherwise declared incompetent. But that includes everyone who is committed to an institution for being violent to people who are committed for eating disorders. It doesn't matter. So these provisions are quite overbroad. Uh, the domestic violence provision is not. It is tailored, although it too has some interesting problems at the margin. So to qualify under the restraining order provision, one of two things has to be present. Either the court has to make a finding that the person is a credible threat to a close family member, or, and again, this is an or, not an and, the restraining order itself just has to say don't harass, stalk, etc., the close family member. Now again, this is a facial challenge, and Mr. Rahimi, the upstanding citizen that he is, uh, qualified under both. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, the court can duck a lot of the hard issues if it wants to. Uh, I think that the second subpart, that just putting it on the face of the restraining order is extraordinarily problematic. There is no requirement in the federal law that that order be issued after some credible finding. Now, as a practical matter, maybe it is, at least in theory, although a lot of these orders are issued under somewhat minimal evidence, as Judge Ho noted in his concurrence. No judge wants to be responsible 
uh, for a person who commits a violent act later. And so I think oftentimes if they're going to err, they're going to err on the side of issuing these things. But at any rate, so there are some issues uh, that are percolating under the surface here with regard to, you know, is it, is it entirely constitutional or is it not? or is it unconstitutional in part? And unfortunately for Mr. Rahimi, the way that the court has uh, generally done spatial challenges outside the First Amendment is to ask whether it is constitutional, unconstitutional in all its applications, or sometimes they say whether the statute has a plainly legitimate sweep. And I have a feeling they're gonna say, well, we don't have to decide every application, he's good enough. <laughs> and, you know, I think this may end up with a little bit of a whimper that, uh, they're just going to say, you know, we'll leave the hard issues for another day. They do this in Second Amendment cases and have since the 19th century. Uh, you know, we might leave the hard issues to another day. Uh, but there is this question of what to do about all these felon in possession cases that are coming through the wings. Probably get GVR'd in light of Rahimi, but we'll see. Uh, but there's also kind of an institutional question that's going on here, that when Congress passed the Gun Control Act, it also allowed the Secretary of the Treasury to, uh, to give relief from disabilities for those whose gun possession would not be uh, dangerous to public safety. And for many years, uh, the Secretary issued case-by-case -case determinations. Now, no one, including the professionals, knows who's going to become violent and who's going to be not. Uh, and some percentage of people who were granted relief from disabilities reoffended. And so in the 1990s, Congress shut off the money for the Relief from Disability Program. And so it's no longer the executive's purview uh, to determine gun possession of those who have old and stale convictions. The question is whether courts are going to take up the slack and whether you're going to see case-by-case -case determinations made. And I think this is the big issue that Rahimi will shed a little bit of light on uh, but probably not much. But again, the case could be huge. The case could work a reformation of the text history and tradition test, or it could just be a narrow case that, hey, all nine of us agree, not him. He is not law-abiding. Law <laughs> and Fifth Circuit, you know, we appreciate your enthusiasm, but you went a little too far here. All right. Quick song and dance on bump stocks. Yes, okay. Don't I, we, tell law professors that they have seven minutes. For Sorry. anything. The, uh, the, my <laughs> thought on bump stocks. We have a 2-2 two -two circuit split. They have not granted cert yet. Everyone agrees they need to grant cert here. Uh, the kind of thought of, uh, I'll do it in about, I'll do it in a minute. I'll keep it to one minute. But the, the one minute version of the bump stocks, uh, I think this is the first clash, the first real clash. It is not literally the first clash, but it's the first real clash between Chevron and the rule of lenity. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Trump administration, you know, originally was said, we're going to go to Congress, we'll get a bump stock ban. And then President Trump said, no, I have this. I will order the Justice Department to do this. And the question really is, when you have a provision that is capable, theoretically, of multiple interpretations, uh, does Chevron deference become part of the criminal law? Or are courts bound to exercise their independent judgment? I think this case is going to get caught up in the cases that Professor Mascott mentioned about whether Chevron is going to continue or not. Uh, you have justices who are immensely concerned about Chevron generally and a fortiori Chevron, Chevron's application when the criminal law is involved. Now, I'm waiting for a securities litigator to come up to me afterwards and tell me, wait a minute, regulations uh, lead to criminal enforcement all the time. You know, what are you talking talking about, but I think this is kind of a bread and butter regulatory offense, and I think you're going to see a skeptical court uh, whether uh, the executive can create a new, uh, essentially a new offense or expand what was the definition of machine gun before it, but query whether the court sidesteps the issue by saying bump stocks are within the plain tax, which I don't think would be true. The whole thing about, there's a whole cottage industry in the gun industry of trying to figure out how to get the trigger to go back and forth very, very quickly because the definition of machine gun is it shoots one shot with a single function of the trigger. And so there are all kinds of devices. But, you know, it's possible they say, look, you pull this thing once and the gun vibrates and it, you know, goes off multiple times. So there are a lot of ways that they can duck the issue. But I think if they reach the issue, I suspect you will see a significant curtailment of Chevron in cases where there are criminal applications. 
Okay, we are going to have audience questions, I swear, though we may only get to one by <laughs> virtue of these guys. Uh, but I do have a lightning round, which I fear telling you guys, maybe we need to talk about the definition of lightning. <laughs> it's, that's, lightning strikes are quick, they're like this. <laughs> that's a lightning strike. Okay, uh, two lightning round questions. One, what are you looking for coming out of the long conference? Is there one case that you've got your eye on? In the alternative, uh, what isn't the court taking um, cough, cough, qualified immunity? Uh, we'll start here, we'll go down. Please teach them what lightning is. <laughs> uh, really quickly, there's the, there are these petitions, the net choice petitions about uh, these laws in Texas and Florida. Um, Texas and Florida concerned that Facebook and Twitter were uh, biased against conservatives in their content moderation. And so these laws uh, regulate those content moderation policies. And uh, the Fifth Circuit um, said that was OK. And the Eleventh Circuit said it was not OK. And so it's uh, very likely that the court will want to weigh in on that. Disclosure, husband of the pod does represent net choice in one of those cases. I did not tell him to say that. Aaron, you're next. <laughs> Um, let's see, there's so many good ones on the law conference. Um, there's a case asking the court to overrule Hill versus Colorado, uh, which uh, said that a buffer zone um, was okay even if you just wanted to speak with someone. Um, so an interesting uh, First Amendment question. There's also, we were discussing all these great Fourth Amendment cases. Like if there's a uh, search dog that bumps into your car, but the police officer does not direct him to bump into your car, um, <laughs> is that unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment? So, so I, I love, love the Fourth Amendment cases too, and there's a bunch of those. See, they've done very well at Lightning. Let's see how we go with this table. <laughs> I'm going to be so fast. Um, I was interested in post-Harvard affirmative action cases. None of them are close to getting up this term, but there are three interesting ones to watch. The suit against the Military Academy for using affirmative action carve-out that Chief Justice Roberts flagged. A suit against a venture capital firm that only invests in founders of color. And then the suit against many employers who are race-conscious under Title VI, and their America First legal has filed complaints with the EOC, but they haven't yet gotten to court. Be so quick, I'm gonna pass. What? I'll take her time. That's very I got her time. <laughs> uh, uh, so th you win. <laughs> this is uh, this is not the long conference. It's the October sixth conference with Larrabee versus Del Toro. Which the question here uh, is whether Congress can apply military law to military retirees and court martial them. Uh, this the D.C. Circuit's held that they could. I think this is one of the most dangerous decisions to come out of the D.C. Circuit. Uh, because it means that military retirees, they went further than military retirees. The D.C. Circuit said anyone for whom there's military status and a duty to follow military order. So Congress doesn't impose full military jurisdiction on the reserves, but under the D.C. Circuit test it could. And I think this is extraordinarily dangerous. You'll have a military uh, where when people retire, they can never partake in the constitutional freedoms that they defend for others. It invites abuse by the executive branch. Uh, and it also means that retire, retired officers should be ineligible to sit in Congress because if they are officers of the United States, uh, the incompatibility clause prevents them from sitting in Congress and with good reason. I mean, imagine if President Trump had been elected 10 years before he had and he and uh, Senator John McCain had had it out. It's a good chance President Trump would have called to court martial John McCain for using disparaging words against the president. So, you know, there are huge separation of powers problems here. And again, I filed an amicus. I felt strongly enough in this, that case. It's not the long conference, but it is one that I'm watching closely. I was going to say, you seem mixed on how it should turn out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, good. All right, we are going to start with you then for this lightning round, uh, which is just a, a larger question on this court. Um, as Dean likes to point out, 50% of the cases are unanimous. Let's focus on the other 50%, Dean. Um, people call this a 6-3 court. I've referred to it as a 3-3-3 court. However you want to think about it, you have six justices, at least, that purport to practice originalism, textualism, but they're not coming out the same way in the vast majority of those non-unanimous cases. Why? Okay, two things. One, there are not six textualist judges. 
There are three originalist just justices. I think there are two, the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh, who are really Burkean conservatives, and you have to really put Justice Kavanaugh under duress to make him admit that he's an originalist. And I think you have a sixth justice, Justice Alito, whose guiding principle of constitutional interpretation is that he hates criminals. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't really care. So that's one issue. And the second reason is even among the originalists, the you know, some of these cases are hard cases as a historical matter. Uh, just because you're using the same methodology doesn't mean you read the history the same way. I, I, so a couple, so I, 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 I'm going to call, call it a mostly 5-4 court. Um, I'll leave it to you to determine who peels off and how we lose the six. Um, but I, on some of the things, I do, th I mean, look, as a law clerk uh, in 08, 09, and so a couple years after Justice Alito came on the bench, I do, I do think that particularly initially maybe, um, I don't know if it was the kinds of cases or just how they were coming out, that it did look like, you know, executive branch background in DOJ, that's shaping perspective. But I, I actually really think um, over the years, particularly the last four or five, that there has been just even more, and it's always been there, but more obviously resounding strength and a real um, like synergy between Justice Alito and Justice Thomas. And I'm gonna make the bold statement here, maybe it's not that bold, that they are the two most, can I say they're the two most closely aligned? I'm sure that'll get, in, in, in the conservative side. So, um, because Justice Gorsuch often peels off with sort of a more pro-libertarian uh, streak, and then I think that the distinction between some of the others is not actually really on what they think the right answer is, but is on the application of stare decisis and how far to go in a particular case. But I think that by and large on most issues, J Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett, um, and Gorsuch and Alito and Thomas are aligning on conservative uh, outcomes. I think that the chief is coming along when it can be written in a way that is not explicitly overruling or being perceived to overrule big precedent. And I think it's quite interesting, actually, um, that Dobbs was 5-1-3, and the Harvard and UNC cases, there were the six, and I think it's because there was just a, a little more finessing in terms of how the overruling was handled in that case, and the, the chief came along. But I think, I think really any distinctions, and, and I actually, Justice Kavanaugh is, is a resounding originalist and talked about it quite extensively in his confirmation hearings. Nine out of the 10, nine out of 10 cases last term uh, did not have, for instance, the three Democratic appointees on the same side. Jeff, why? Let me start with the conservatives. Um, this is such an exciting time to be thinking about originalism, and broadly, there do seem to be very different approaches between the three textualist justices, Justices Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito, and the three text history and tradition justices, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Barrett, and the most dramatic case is Moore and Harper. And wasn't that a fascinating, stark example of how the three textualists said, the history doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that, as the, as the Chief Justice pointed out, there is no history of an attempt to exclude state legislatures from, uh, and, uh, and, and state courts from reviewing election results. And in fact, all the historical arguments from the framers to Marbury to, uh, the Federalist Papers point in the opposite direction, uh, the textualist said legislature means legislature, not courts. This gap, which wasn't obvious until last term, suggests that in a whole bunch of cases, the textualist justices just aren't gonna look at the original understanding. And that uh, voting rights case I talked about is another, the affirmative action cases are yet another one, and there is still more. Those of us who've been following the originalism debate since um, the Federalist Society so powerfully put it on the table decades ago, I, I don't think we, I'll just speak for myself, I hadn't seen this turn. It was not articulated in the debates that when a textualist decides the text is clear, she doesn't have to look at history at all. And I think it's under theorized to say the least. We had a great uh, NCC debate about, about differences among originalism with Sharif Gurgis and Anastasia Bowden and Evan Burnick, and, and, and they hadn't seen it coming. And um, I think that it has huge practical consequences, and it's also leading to some doctrinal confusion. The problem with Bruin has been broadly criticized by originalists as well as non 
originalists. And the criticism is text, uh, hi hi history and tradition was only supposed to kick in for unenumerated rights, like Glucksburg. You're not supposed to look at shifting traditions when you have a textual right, like the Second Amendment. And what's the time that you stop at? Is it 1868, or is it today, or sometime in between? Justice Barrett flagged that by saying the court hasn't figured it out the relevance of liquidation, as she called it, or subsequent practice. But it seemed like a kind of mushy compromise to stick this history and tradition test in the middle of a textually enumerated right in a way that's that doesn't, it's hard to make theoretical sense of and it's causing a lot of practical confusion. So I, I think this is a really significant uh, shift. It'll be worked out in all sorts of ways and that's important. The liberals, I, you know, I don't know. They, they don't have a chance. Of course, they have huge differences in approaches and you see it. Um, I haven't uh, parsed it all, but Justice Barrett and Justice Gorsuch are joining in interesting cases, of course, in his Native American jurisprudence, but in other places. And you have more pragmatic justices like Justice Kagan, who are still more willing to go to the other side on religion uh, cases and so forth. But the truth is that the doctrinal differences among the non-originalist liberal justices aren't as important because they're not in the majority as much. Aaron. Oh, goodness. Um, so, so I agree um, with something Professor Mascot said about stare decisis. And I think a lot of sort of the, the difference in outcome among um, sort of the blocks of justices can be attributed in part to their views of stare decisis and how much deference is owed to prior decisions or sort of the court um, institutionally speaking. Um, I, I think if you, if you think about textual analysis, I think the court is becoming more um, attuned to that. Um, I think part of that focus is because of Chevron. If you think back to the cases Professor Mascot was talking about, one reason the court has not mentioned Chevron in several terms in either dissent or majority is because during the oral arguments in those cases, the court looked to footnote night in Chevron, which says that the that, uh, courts are supposed to use um, every interpretive tool to arrive at a statutory meeting um, before they find something ambiguous. Um, so, so I agree there's more attention perhaps to particular text. Um, I don't think, however, that that leaves out the original meaning. I think the original meaning um, sheds light, um, and I think uh, the justices, um, many, uh, I think all six of them would agree that the original meaning sheds light on the meaning of the text. Last. Uh, not much to add, just really briefly. Uh, um, I think that uh, originalism and textualism are hard, and so it's unsurprising to see textualists and originalists disagreeing with each other case by case, and it's um, actually good and a signal that they're um, principled and trying to um, reach the right answer and disagreeing on hard um, questions. And, you know, I'd say the um, uh, 25 years ago, maybe, the um, the debates between majority and dissent were not so edifying. I mean, they really seemed to like talk past each other a bit. So, you know, the uh, one side would say, well, but the text and the history say this, and the other side would say, yeah, but th those results will be really bad. And this is not such a satisfying conversation. And um, now I think the kind of the, the intramural debates between, you know, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are deeply edifying and important and interesting. And so there's, um, uh, I think it's actually um, all to the good and as you um, should expect on a court like this. All right, let's open this up for questions. There's a microphone there and you have to go to it or uh, Jean sends me hate mail. So that's, it's a requirement of being up here. Thank you, excellent panel. Uh, I have a question about the Rabini case the gun control case. There's also a provision that makes it uh, a felon if you're uh, using controlled substances. And Jerry Smith in the Fifth Circuit ruled last month that it's unconstitutional applied to someone who was using marijuana. Hunter Biden's been charged with that same provision for using cocaine. Do you think he has an argument to get that dismissed? Although he's also charged with lying on the application form and Frank Easterbrook ruled recently in the Seventh Circuit that you could still be held liable for lying on the form if what you're lying about is unconstitutional. I'd just like to get your, basically your Let me start with the second first. I think there's a bit of a split about whether the false statements are material. Uh, if the underlying uh, answer is not legally valid, I think Judge Easterbrook's opinion is probably right. And the cases saying that they're not material are probably wrong. The court often polices 
uh, false statement provisions fairly broadly. You know, it doesn't police them very much. They just say, look, you, you don't have a right to lie about it. Uh, on the provision itself, uh, I have no idea what's going to happen. I think there are a couple of issues that are going on. One is the increasing legalization of drugs at the state level, which has made federal law out of sync. Uh, I also think there are going to be questions between marijuana and the harder drugs. Uh, and I, it's not clear whether they're going to strike it down in total or just say it's unconstitutional as applied or say it's not unconstitutional at all. So very unsatisfying answer, but I don't, Appreciate I don't think we know what they're going to do on the drug possession. Stay tuned. Other questions from the audience? If not, I have questions. So, okay. Well, great. Uh, my question then is back on standing, actually, and the distinction, if any, that you think, I mean, I, Overall, standing doctrine has devolved, if you will, as it has evolved. We have more and more standing cases, and they're making less and less sense, and they're harder and harder for the lower courts to apply, I would argue, which is why we're getting more standing cases. Um, your case that you spoke about was on intellectual standing. Can you talk a little bit about how aesthetic standing will come into that? And again, I'm looking at the Fifth Circuit. Um, and the Mifeprestone cases, the doctors who brought that argued a version of aesthetic standing, um, that it was hurting them uh, aesthetically potentially as well. So, um, so a couple of clarifications. Um, I represent the doctors in the case. Um, so, so with that sort of uh, caveat, um, I don't think the doctors actually have argued for aesthetic standing. Judge Ho um, and his concurrence noted that they did have aesthetic standing. If it harms someone to see a forest destroyed, um, then why couldn't it harm someone to see a baby destroyed? So makes makes some sense. Um, but what the doctors argued in that case, and seven of seven federal judges have found, is that you have a, a direct and concrete injury um, when you have a conscious objection, a religious objection, to participating in and facilitating an elective abortion. Uh, so these doctors say that they don't uh, believe in elective abortion and that their conscience rights are harmed. So I think that really distinguishes that case from the parade of horribles. Um, you know, the other side has, has argued that, you know, maybe a, a pulmonologist might object to treating a child who's asthmatic uh, because that child um, wouldn't be asthmatic if, if Congress did more about uh, air pollution. Um, but, but of course, that doctor is, is talking about government inaction, not government action here. Um, as well, that doctor presumably doesn't have a conscious objection, um, certainly not one to taking, uh, being involved in taking an unborn life. So, so I think that, that you do have that. The other sort of issue of standing um, is whether there uh, is sufficient imminence. Um, again, seven of seven judges uh, have found that as well. Can I add one other thing here? I think this is one topic where originalists are not being good originalists. Uh, the doctrine has just moved away from original meaning. The traditional requirement of litigation is that you have a legal injury. It is not that you have consequential damage. And the modern standing doctrine confuses legal injury and consequential harm, and I think that is causing a lot of the mixed cases that are coming about. Let's talk a little bit about text history and tradition then to wrap up. Um, and Jeff, I'm sort of curious of your thoughts on this. A, uh, and this has been raised by some other folks out there, what is the difference between uh, history and tradition? Hmm. Or is it just a nice phrase? I mean, literally, that's what some people have argued to me. Like, no, 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 it just sounds nice. It's a triplet, you know? It's so, <laughs> it's so important, and we're trying to teach the methodologies to middle school kids at the Constitution Center and have a chart of the methodologies, text, history, tradition, structure of pragmatism, and precedent. And as I understood it for the middle school version, uh, text is text, history is original understanding or original public meaning uh, at the time of ratification, and tradition is the shifting traditions of our people, as Justice Cardozo called it, over time from the founding until today. So the example of the big tradition case is Glucksburg, which says that you look at should it, uh, traditions at a specific level of generality from the founding to today. And Griswold, Justice Harlan's concurring opinion, says tradition is a living thing. So that raises that question I flagged before. When do you look at tradition and when history? And again, I thought Originalism 101 is, if you've got a textual provision, you look at history in 1868 or 17, 
89, and you only look to tradition when you're looking for unenumerated rights like Glucksburg and Griswold. And what's not clear now is tradition is being invoked both in Dobbs and in uh, Bruin, um, even though in one case you have a text and the other you don't. And that's why Justice Barrett is so right to raise this question of, of when liquidation or subsequent practice matters, because the practice, which is the tradition as opposed to the history, might only matter for an originalist when at the time of ratification, one final thought on this, uh, a big difference between uh, Madison and Jefferson here. Jefferson, a strict constructionist, says you just look at the text and the original understanding at the time of ratification, and Madison comes to accept the constitutionality of the bank because over 20 years, the people in Congress have come to accept it, and he's much more uh, keen on tradition and liquidation that Why way. Is tradition now sound to me like living constitutionalism, and am I supposed to believe that Justice Thomas was like, pew, pew, living constitutionalism, to great. Completely, no, you're absolutely <laughs> right that this, uh, it, it's not at all clear what, how a tradition-based approach constrains judges any more than uh, living constitutionalism, and for originalists to be able to invoke tradition as a get-out-of-jail-free card, the liberals are saying, is a kind of whack-a-mole game that makes originalism as unconstraining as living constitutionalism, that basically if you shift between the text at the time of ratification, you shift between history and tradition unmoored by whether or not there's a text, uh, then, then the game is up. So there are hugely significant practical and, and theoretical consequences of this. Game. All right. Jen and Aaron both had something to add to that, and then we'll wrap. I was just going to say, Robert can correct me as a fellow former Thomas Clerk if he thinks I'm saying this wrong, but I think if we're talking about tradition and Justice Thomas and Bruin, I saw tradition in that case as almost being an extra barrier. Like, it's, it's like you don't get to regulate guns under the Second Amendment because you have this textual historical right. And by the way, if you're going to try to show that somehow the regulation fit within this area we said must still be permissible, um, after Heller, you're going to have to show me a tradition of it. And so that's sort of an extra requirement. And so query what went on behind the scenes to bring all that in and have it be articulated that way. Um, some, you know, you got to get five justices at least signing these, some of these opinions. It just feels like if we're going to hold uh, uh, staff in Congress to every word and look up the definitions and dictionaries at the time that they put it into statutes, we can expect something of uh, text history and tradition. I should be able to look that up in a dictionary. <laughs> so, so I think one way possibly to reconcile us is not to think of tradition as I think the criticisms are as sort of, you know, Justice Jackson's concurrence in Youngstown when he's talking about, you know, tradition between how the different branches have related can, can lead to sort of a constitutional meaning. Um, I don't think that's what Justice Thomas meant um, at all. Um, I think you can perhaps reconcile it by saying that history and tradition are in lieu of the text. So what was the historical, uh, you know, what was happening at the time? Um, what was the tradition right at the founding? So, so if you limit it, or, or 1868, uh, so if you limit it to those time periods, I don't think it's necessarily inconsistent, um, but, but I agree that, that we'll see. Yeah. And um, uh, just one other footnote, I mean, you might note that some provisions, uh, some textual provisions seem to invite an inquiry into tradition. So maybe cruel and unusual sure. punishments like the unusualness might, your uh, tradition might help um, uh, inform your unusualness inquiry, maybe more controversially. Uh, what processes do or whether a search is unreasonable, but that there might be a textual hook for a tradition inquiry. Can I add one quick thing? I think with the rights, it's a little bit different too because the theory at the framing with the rights is that they weren't new rights. They were codifying pre-existing rights and so you have to figure out what the pre-existing right is. And so to do that, one is you need to have some sense of what the legal tradition is at the framing because these were established traditions. And second is you need to have some sense of the history of the specific events that prompted the codification of the right because that guides you in how you interpret the right because rights are instrumental things and they are designed to prevent certain abuses of government power. 
And with that, we might hope that the court this term will uh, expand on this conversation and give us a little more on text history and tradition, as I'm sure they will in this term and coming terms as well. Thank you so much on behalf of the Federalist Society for being here for the Supreme Court preview. Uh, it's been a treat. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and please enjoy the rest of your pretty rainy day here in Washington, DC. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.